Hello and welcome to this new episode of Sartorial Talks with a Parisian gentleman. And today, this is our last episode dedicated to the different kinds of shoe for men. you gentlemen and also of some ladies I must admit want to understand more and more what they wear what is the history behind what is the the spirit of what they were who wh how is it crafted where is it crafted and all this is the subject of these sartorial talks and today we're going to cover two very important type of shoes for men which are the ankle boots and the loafers and Sonia will start with the very iconic ankle boot which is called the chuka boot that's right, the chuka boot, um, as with all these, is usually considered a more casual style of boot. Uh, but as you know, lately, a lot of men are mixing casual shoes, even tennis shoes, with suits. So you don't have to limit your mind to think, I'm only gonna wear these blue jeans or a, a casual outfit. You can be more creative and even put these with a suit ensemble if you're moved to do that. So this particular boot is sometimes confused with the desert boot, but in fact, the chuka is the correct term. The desert boot was developed later on to, um, with more gripping soles to actually be used in the desert and also more um, aeration of the, of the leather itself so that, of course, the desert's warm so the shoe can breathe. But speaking specifically of the chuka, um, we're going to go to the subject of polo. Chuka is a term used for a seven minute um, play in the sport of polo. And a lot of people say that because of the similarities, maybe of the style, uh, that that term chuka was used for the boot itself. You have your own probably ideas of what this boot means to you. For me, I, I think of someone maybe playing guitar, um, wearing blue jeans um, around a campfire, or maybe a rugged style individual, but that's my perception. But it's actually a very versatile boot to have, and I think most men um, couldn't complain having it in their closet. So yeah, just talk about um somebody playing guitar, and that's a very good transition for me because we're gonna talk now about the Chelsea boot. I used to, um, call this boot the lazy boot because this is a boot which you can just go put your foot into without any laces it's like the boot version of a loafer but it's also called an easy boot because you have a kind of an elastic thing so it was created um, i mean the british tried to convince us that they invented everything in the world but that's true that they invented a lot of things in the shoe industry. And that was invented around the royal family. There was a famous castle called the Balmoral Castle. That was the residence of vacation. And many people have been creating for the royal family different kinds of shoes. The Chelsea boot was created for the queen, actually. So it was historically a woman's shoe, but it evolved uh, very nicely and it became a man's shoe and an ankle boot. Why is it called a Chelsea boot? And that's what the most interesting is. In the 50s and in the 60s, there was a street in a suburb of London called Chelsea, which was called King's Road in Chelsea, which is in the suburb of London. And this street was called the Swinging London Street. The Rolling Stone were living specifically in this area of London, and so all of them were wearing, I don't know why, I have my little idea about that, that because those shoes are a little bit more rock and roll than the formal shoe that people were wearing back in these years. So they were adopted by this new generation and this old generation of people who had a little bit of swing. They wanted to be more free, and this is an easy boot to have. So once again, uh, the Chelsea boot uh, is something that Every gentleman which is interested in, in, in shoes should have in his wardrobe because it's easy to wear, it's easy to maintain. Uh, this one is mounted on a, on a rubber sole, so it's basically indestructible if you maintain it in the long run, but it can be worn in different situations. So that's the story behind the Chelsea boot. Now we move to the next and the last 
category of the shoes that we have to cover in this mini-series, which are the loafers. So the loafers are the epitome of the lazy shoe. Because you don't have, in, in, in England we call them the slip-on. That is to say, you don't have to bend. You don't even have for some people, and I strongly disagree with that, but this is how people act. You don't even have to use a shoe horn. You just, you know, slip on your shoes and you walk outside in front, for example, to buy your baguettes. There are different kinds of um, loafers. For once, I can say, I don't know if we invented the loafer, but I can say that in France we have a national pride, is that one of the most iconic loafer in the world is French. And it's what is called the penny loafer. So I have in front of me two beautiful models of penny loafers. One which is, which is in boxcalf and one which is in boxcalf and suede. So these are very, very popular uh, loafers. The house who popularized the penny loafer is a French brand which is, which is called J.M. Western. J.M. Western is located in Limoges, in the, in the middle of France, actually center of France. And they have a model which is called the Loffer 180. The Loffer 180 is an important shoe in France that half of the executive in every corporation are wearing. And Daniel Porcelli from Corbleu Union, this store where we are today once again, gave me the reason why the executive they love, and specifically now in the USA, to wear this kind of shoe, is that when they work, under their desk, they like to remove their shoes and then put them back and then remove and put them back. If you have a Balmoral boot with uh, 18 eyelets, it's a little bit more difficult to remove than to remove and put back this shoe. So this is why the penny loafer is extremely successful, specifically among executives. But it's also a shoe which is extremely correlated to a movement which we call the Ivy League. This shoe is the epitome of the Ivy League style, the Ivy League style that you guys in America understand what I'm talking about. This is the style of the student of the best university, the Ivy League university in your country. For the people in Europe who don't know that, it was um, basically to make a long story short, the Ivy League style was this wealthy young gentlemen who were in the best university, the most expensive college in the United States, and who wanted to be, you know, to fight against the norm a little bit by, while staying very wealthy, but trying to break a little bit the rules and to wear something a little bit differently. And the penny loafer was a staple in this movement. Why do we call this a penny loafer? Because the legend says the young people, when they were at college, back in the years, there were no cell phones. They used to call their parents once a week or so twice a week if they were very good boys. And they need, needed to have a penny to put in the phone booth. And in order not to forget to phone their parents once a week, they would put a penny inside. This is why we call this a penny loafer. And you, it can be made in full leather, it can be made in suede. It's a very versatile shoe that a lot of people love. I may be the only one who doesn't like penny loafer, but my personal taste has nothing to do in this episode because I think it's shortening a little bit my foot, but many people love it for its comfort and its style. Then we move to the next kind of loafer, which is called a tassel loafer. Why a tassel loafer? Because on the shoe you have these small things. In French, call it a pompille. So this was very famous in your country back in the 90s and early 2000s, specifically in the world of bankers and lawyers. You saw a lot of lawyers and bankers wearing these strange shoes with these small tassels. The history goes is that there was a Manhattan shoemaker back in the years, in the 50s, late 50s, early 60s, and his name was Farkas and Kovacs. For anybody who is interested in soccer, Kovacs immediately sound Hungarian. 
And that's giving me a good occasion to explain to you that Hungary is a brilliant school of shoemaker. And there's a lot of people like Laszlo Vaz, which is extremely well known among the shoe lovers, and other people. You go to Budapest, you can have access to a lot of fantastic shoemaker for very affordable prices. But of course, the style of the Hungarian shoes are a little bit more bulky than what, what we do here in America, in England, or in France, because uh, the the, the climate in Hungary is a little bit more tough, so the shoes are much more sturdy and much more bulky. Farkas and Kovacs in New York City in the late 60s had one idea, because it was not unusual back in the day to have laces which, were, which had these kind of tassels at the end of the laces. It was some kind of a refinement that some gentlemen liked to use. And this gentleman had an idea for a customer to take this end of the laces and stitch them directly on the shoe. So, because by definition, a loafer has no laces. So they adapt something that was made for laces, for laces as a decoration, as an ornamentation, and to put them directly on the top of the shoe. It became the tassel loafer that you may see your banker or your lawyer wearing it a lot in the late, late 90s, early 2000s. And tassel loafers are coming back uh, more and more these days, because now with the new, with the explosion of the men's shoe market, uh, we can make them in suede. They can be funny shoes to wear. Once again, not really my cup of tea, personally, but I'm French, I prefer co coffee anyway. But it's uh, something that some gentlemen might like to have in their wardrobe. And then we move to the very last shoe type of our series on men's shoe, which is called, in French, le mocassin. I don't know why you pronounce this in English. Le mocassin, I suppose, and Sonia will cover this subject for you. This is a very nice shoe for every gentleman to have. And I think many of you already know what I'm going to say, that it's not only a moccasin, but it's also a driving shoe. And so if you really want to carry the aspect of being a gentleman to the forest level, get a pair of moccasins and call them your driving shoes. And this is a lovely way to protect your other shoes from damage, just from using uh, the brake pedal, the accelerator, you know, moving around while you're driving. And this is a great option to take care of your other shoes. Um, the moccasin is actually a Native American shoe, and the origin is from a type of tribe called the Algonquian, typically made out of suede, um, the, uh, the identifying factors of the nice leather bow on top. Um, it's a shoe that a lot of people also use to change when they come in indoors um, out from their shoes so they want dirty up their home. So it's a nice way, thing to have beside your front door to change into when you come into your home. Uh, I think it's a nice tribute to Native American Indians, and I think it's a great way to be comfortable when you're um, outdoors. And I just think that this shoe is something every gentleman should own. I don't know if you agree. You don't have any, so you need to buy a pair. By the way, this is probably the less expensive type of shoe of all the shoes we covered in this series. I hope that series of three episodes of Sorter Talk was informative for you, was interesting for you, that with this series you have a good overview of the different kind of shoe that every gentleman should own in his wardrobe. We're not saying here that you have to have 10 pairs of shoes, but maybe nine. I'm joking. Uh, I hope to see you in the next episode of Sorter Talks, and in the meantime, cheers. <laughs>